All right, a pleasant good evening to everyone, and we want to welcome you to our midweek prayer and study hour. We hope and pray that, as of always, you had a wonderful day. And if you've just logged on, we say a pleasant good evening to everyone, whether you are viewing us via live stream, whether you're viewing us via YouTube, whether you're on the job, um, wherever you are at this time, we'd like to say welcome, welcome, welcome to our midweek prayer and study hour. And we pray that as you have, have logged on, you will be tremendously blessed by, by this, evening's, this evening's study. Please pardon me. Let me just... You'll be blessed by this evening's, this evening's study. Um, friends, again, as you know, if you have not, we want to encourage you guys to please do subscribe to the church's channel. Um, go to that website, click that subscription button. And maybe you may know someone who could be benefited from, from the church's ministry. Do refer them to it, have them subscribe. And while you're there, please remember to subscribe to my own personal channel. Type my name in Carlton Not. We have a plethora of videos on the channel that are designed, we know, to help you, to build you up spiritually in the things that pertain to the Most High, the Most High God. And if you would like, brothers and sisters, to be added to our mailing list to receive the study guides for this particular um, session, we want to encourage you guys to email us at info at wellingtonsda.com or c.not at thefinalmovements.com and we'll do our best to add you to our mailing list and also to get you the lessons you desire. Friends, as you know, tonight is our midweek prayer and praise service and we want to encourage everyone to make full use of the three angels voice of hope. I went backwards, right? I want to encourage you guys to don't let the the blessings of this ministry pass you by. Um, we do need the prayers of those we love. And as I've always, we've stated that there is a place for personal prayer. There is a place for family prayer, but there's also a place and a space for corporate prayer. And as we unite our voices together, um, we can harness the power. And so friends, if you have not, if you have a prayer request you'd like to, um, to someone to attend to, we pray that you'll dial it in, 305-676-4113. And to join in the mornings and in the evenings and midnight, 561-440-6854. And you'll find people on who have a common goal, that is to be saved in God's eternal kingdom and to harness the almighty prayer. Friends, as we've said, it is customary in the Adventist church for us to use the midweek, Wednesday night, or in Christendom rather, for a time of reflection and contemplation, for a time to reminisce on God's goodness towards us when last we met on, on the Lord's Day. And tonight we have come, brothers and sisters, because we all see our soul's great need. What is it? It is for a closer walk with Jesus. Um, all of us have a desire to be saved in God's kingdom, but we must be saved in God's appointed way. And one of the agencies by which God hath um, laid down in the plan of salvation, whereby we need it to be saved, it is through prayer. And we believe that more is accomplished by prayer than by preaching. And as long as we pray, we should live. It is only as we live that we pray. Martin Luther once said, pray and let God worry. Amen. Pray and let God worry. And so tonight, Mrs. Spurgeon says, we must learn to cast the burdens off the present. Do you have a present burden? What is it? Is it a financial burden? Is it a marital burden? Is it a burden of child rearing? Is it a burden of decision? Whatever your burden is, we want to cast the burden of the presence along with the sins of the past. What sin did you commit? prior to the sunset. What sin did um, overcame you today? We want to cast that sin along with the fear of the future upon the Lord because he ever careth for us. And friends, I have come to realize this, that every difficulty is a call to prayer. 
every difficulty. And why are the sons and daughters of God so reluctant to pray when prayer is a key in the hands of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse? Angels marvel that we do not pray. And friends, if there is any area in your Christian life which you do not want to do little of, it is in the arena of prayer. Satan's fear of prayer. And Satan well knows that all whom he can get to neglect prayer and the searching of the scriptures will be overcome by his attacks. Therefore, he invents every possible device to engross the minds. If he can keep you and I away from the power, from the place of prayer, then friends, he knows, he well knows that he will well overcome us. And so, friends, tonight, I do not know what, what prayer requests you may have. Perchance, there's something that's on your heart that you'd like to make known to the saints in the chat group. At this time, you may just, just type it in. If you have a silent request, just put silent, and we will, we will make mention of that. If you have a personal request, um, which you do not feel, which you, don't, which you feel comfortable in sharing, go ahead, brothers and sisters, and put that request in the chat group. As we look around, it is, it is evident that eternity is before us. And so, friends, tonight I want to encourage you. Let us not become weary in well-doing, because in due season we will reap if we faint, if we faint not. And it's good to know tonight that though death and pain around me fly, Till Jesus bids, friends, I cannot die. Not an arrow can hit until the God of love permits. And so tonight we've come to unite our voices in prayer. And as the song says, "'Tis the blessed hour of prayer, while when our hearts lowly bend, as we gather to Jesus, our Savior and friend, and if we come to him in faith, his protection to share, oh, what a balm for the weary. Oh, how sweet to be there. Blessed hour of prayer. Blessed hour of prayer. Friends, what a balm for the weary. Oh, how sweet to be there. Tonight we are going to plan and prepare to, to unite our voices in prayer. Tan Powell, I see silent prayer for the Paul's family, definitely, definitely. And we want you to remember um, our members, our brothers and sisters that make up the Wellington group. Some of them have, um, have contracted the COVID. Um, many are isolated, many are recovering. Some are about to go into surgery. Um, some have serious health issues. And we want you to remember them in your personal prayer requests. And we are going to make mention of them in our public prayer. And so tonight, my dear friends, while I pray and while you plead and while we see our own sweet need, let us turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. Then the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let us, let us pray. All right, let us pray. <clears throat> what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, Lord, hallowed be thy most holy and righteous name. Tonight we approach your throne of grace and mercy and justice in the name of our elder brother, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who for our sake became poor that through his poverty we might become rich. Lord, tonight we come claiming the promise, if any man sin, that we have an advocate with the Father 
who is Jesus Christ the righteous and that he is the propitiation for our sins and not just for us, but for the entire world. Tonight we come claiming the promise that if we confess our sins that he is faithful and just to forgive us. And Lord, tonight we come just acknowledging your, your, your sovereignty, acknowledging your goodness and your mercies towards the children of men. You are such a, God, a good God, a God that is full of mercy and compassion, a God who takes no delight in the suffering of your creatures, a God who is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. And in that you have made a way for us, Lord. You've made a bridge over troubled waters, and that bridge is Jesus. And Lord, as professing Christians, we must confess tonight that we did not rightly represent you today in word, in thought, and in deed. We allowed sin, Lord, to gain the mastery and the victory of us, and we have all sinned. Every one in the chat group tonight and on Facebook Live, we have sinned in word, in thought, and in deed, and we come, Lord, casting ourselves on the mercy of Christ and his redeeming blood, and we say, Lord, please blot out our transgressions. Forgive us of our iniquities and our abominations, Lord, and our transgressions. May you create in us clean, clean heart, and may you renew a right spirit within us. O oh Lord, may you grant us the early and the latter rain power so we can live a life, live a spirit-filled life in thy sight. We thank you, O oh God, for the trials that comes our way because they do drive us to the mercy seat. And as Mr. Spurgeon says, anything that makes us pray, it is a blessing. So we never, we will not murmur nor complain, but in everything, we will give you thanks. O oh Lord, remember the sick and the shut in amongst us, especially those who are at Wellington, those who have contracted the COVID virus, Lord, those who have other illnesses, Lord, those who plan to go into surgery, Lord, those who are battling with, with depression, Lord, and just who are oftentimes discouraged and de depressed. We lift them up, dear Father. Remember every prayer request that was mentioned um, tonight, Lord, in the chat group. You know them by name. I pray that you will attend to everyone and also the silent requests. Lord, remember our children, dear Father. It is so difficult, Lord, to raise children in these last days. And oftentimes we, ourselves, as we look at what they have in inherited from us, the evil disposition, Lord, and they are aided by the evils in themselves, we oftentimes wonder, Lord, will our children make it? But, O oh God, tonight we place them on the altar and that you will fight for them, O oh God, dear Lord, that you will send your holy angels to watch over them and may your Holy Spirit bring them back to conviction, bring them back to the God of their fathers. Father, remember especially our brothers and sisters who have transitioned into foreign lands, Lord. We pray for them and their families. Remember, O oh God, at the World Church, the initiatives that have been laid down for evangelism, the emphasis on prayer. Remember, Lord, the evangelistic campaigns that are currently running on social media. Remember the pastors, the teachers, the administrators, Lord, the Bible workers, those who are in self-supporting ministry. We pray for them, dear Father, that there will be a unity and a harmony in the work. Oh Lord, it is apparent that the coming crisis is soon to break upon us. And we need an experience, O oh God, which we do not now possess. And wrestling with God, how few know what it is. O oh Lord, may you help us to see more the need of prayer and fasting and studying your word. May you grant us victory over sin, we pray in Jesus. Tonight, as we have come, Lord, to be inspired, to be edified, to be encouraged, to be enriched from your word. Disappoint us not, we pray. Speak to our hearts and we'll be very mindful to give you all the praise and all the honor and all the well done. These and other unnamed mercies we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.
All right, my brothers and sisters, we want to say uh, good evening to everyone. And if you've just logged on, we say welcome to our um, prayer and study hour. And um, if you've just logged on, we want to encourage you guys now to go ahead and copy this link and put it in your WhatsApp, put it on your Facebook page. Let others know that we are about to commence the Trail Blazers. We're still blazing, brothers and sisters. And tonight we have been examining the pioneers historically, chronologically, and experimentally. Our thematic text for this series is Psalms chapter 11, verse 3, where David asks a very point question. He says, if the foundation be destroyed, friends, what can the righteous do? And we have been admonished that in our history we should reflect, we should rehearse the writings of our pioneers, rehearse the men who acted a part in the establishment of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, of which I and my family are members of. Our thematic quote is, May the fire of their devotion light their way. Where is that flame, dear Lord, which, which burned in Abram's breast and sealed him thine, which made Paul hearts with sorrow melt and glow with energy divine? Is not thy grace as mighty now? As when Elijah felt its power, when glory beamed from Moses' brow, or Job endured the trying hour. Remember, Lord, the ancient days. Renew thy works that grace restore. And while our hearts to thee we bend, on us thy Holy Spirit pour. Lord, tonight we need the flame that burned within the breast of our pioneers to resonate in our hearts. We have been looking at the Millerite movement, a very powerful movement. This movement was so powerful, but friends, did you know that? That in 1844, that the United States of America almost canceled the election of that year because they feared that the world would have come to an end. The power that attended the midnight cry, we're told, was not in the power nor learn of man, but it was in the power of God. And we are an outgrowth. And so tonight we are looking at our pioneers from three perspectives. Historically, we're trying to keep them in their order, chronologically, from dates. But we also want to look at them experimentally. And friends, we, we want to say this, that as we look at our pioneers, there's one thing they all had in common. They had an experience with Jesus. And friends, it is that experience that will keep us through the dark days which are ahead of us. And while we have life and while we have liberty, it behooves us now, brothers and sisters, to become more acquainted with Jesus and the things that pertaineth to his kingdom. And as you have come to this platform tonight, we pray that as we dive into this lesson, it will be a nail in a sure place. We are on lesson 16. We are looking at RFC Crutcher. Last week we looked at him and we highlighted some, some high points and some low points in his life. A man who was opposed to organization. And then he saw the folly and the foolishness of his ways and he reneged that. And he cast his lot with the commandment keeping people of God. You know, brothers and sisters, when the early Adventist church got their early pioneers, began to write. They were very um, intentional in what they did. And they believed that as our faces differ, so do the gifts. And God has given many gifts to his church, which could be used in the advancement of present truth. And one of the gifts which were tapped into was the ability of using poetry or poem to convey the Advent truth. And when we think of, um, of, of poetry and poems, we, we, you know, we, we, we look at people like Annie R. Smith, and we know we may do something on her. I may do something on her, so I'm not going to say much. I think, I'm gonna, I, think I, owe, I, I owe her that. She, she deserves that. I think she deserves us to do a segment, so I'm not going to say too much on her tonight. But look out for a, uh, a presentation on Annie R. Smith, right? Now, as we talked about uh, poetry, 
one of the things that RFC Cottrell had was the ability to use, to connect, or rather to use poetry to convey prophecy. Did you hear what I say, friends? He had the ability to use poetry to convey prophecy or to use poetry to convey our doctrines. And last week we looked at one of the poems he wrote. Um, it's Jewish and it is a, a phraseology that many use. It is Jewish to debunk the keeping of the fourth commandment. And you must understand that poetry is very, very important. But RFC had the ability, we've said, to use, to, 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 to read a prophecy or the apocalypse. And he was able now to sit down by the aid of the Holy Ghost and to put that to poetry. You know, it, it is almost a dying art in the church. We don't really hear um, poems. As a matter of fact, the Review and Herald, when it was published, it always had poetry in it. Poems were, were written, were printed by James White, and a heavy contributor to the, to the, to the poetic section was our Annie R. Smith. We'll we look at her, so I won't say much on her, right? But one of those who contributed heavily to the poetry in the Review and Herald was RFC. Yes, yes. And we are praying that God will resignate, um, revive this gift. And if there's a parent watching and, and your child has has the ability to write poetry, may you steer that gift in a right way. I think we have come to a point now where we need all hands on deck and poetry is a great avenue whereby we can communicate effectively the third angel's message to a dying world. Now, brothers and sisters, one of the most profound prophetic prophecy ever written, um, profound prophetic poetry conveying prophecy, all them P's, that was ever written, was written by RFC, and it was entitled, The Three Persecuting Powers by RFC, and it was printed in the Review and Herald in April 16, 1861, and that poem, it had over 14 stanzas, and we're, gonna, we're going to look at those 14 standards tonight, very rooted and brooded in Scripture. But before we look at that, you must understand that the pioneers were, were, were astute in prophecy. Um, today, the Adventist church is notorious for being a prophetic church, but I'm afraid that the members, m most of the members are not as sharp, or should I say this generation, they are not as sharp as they should be are or, or knowledgeable in regards to the prophecies. But in the early 1800s, our pioneers took great delight, great joy in teaching the prophecies and with them were connected the words, with words, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And so one of the poems, one of the prophecies that caught the attention of RFC was the three persecuting powers. Now, for some of you, this may be a revision, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a brief, do a brief study on, these, on the three persecuting powers, and then we're going to look at the wonderful poem that RFC wrote. I, I, I bet you this, I bet you when he wrote this poem in, in, in 1861, he, had, he, never had, he never dreamed that a, that a young man from um, Mount Lebanon, Jamaica, would actually be using his poetry and sharing it with others. You see, brothers, I'll tell you something. One thing Mr. Spurgeon says he knows, that God knows and we do not know. Who knows where our influence will be? If, 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 if he had thought that, 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 you know, in the future, what, a hundred years in the future, um, you know, a young Jamaican young man named Knott would, would have found, his, found this poem and be using it to encourage others. You, he would have said, I don't think so. But friends, it tells me we must continue to work for Jesus and who knows where our influence will take us. Now, so we're going to br briefly do a, uh, do a brief study. Br very, very brief. Very, very brief. I had to cut this one short because I wanted to get to the point. But just quickly summarizing the three persecuting 
pretty impressed. Now, let's take our lesson. We hope you're able to print out your study guides and we're filling in the blanks. If not, just get a piece of paper, jot the lesson, jot the answers down, and in your quiet time, be like the Bereans, because they were more noble than those of Thessalonica. Now, question one says now, what threefold powers will eventually unite to fight against God's people? While John was on the Isles of Patmos, he was given a series of visions um, by Gabriel. And one of the visions he saw was this. Revelation chapter 16, verse 3. Now, John said now, And I saw three unclean spirits. Emphasize, there are unclean spirits like frogs. And this is the only time frogs is mentioned in the New Testament. When we think of frogs, we must go back to Egypt, which was, I think, frogs was the seventh plague or the fifth plague. Uh, don't quote me on it, right? And the reason why we learned that God sent the plague there were 10 plagues, each plague was a deity. The Egyptians worshipped the goddess, the frog head goddess called Hecu. It was worshipped for its creative powers, right? So when we think frog, we must go back to Egypt. And this is the only time frogs is actually mentioned in the New Testament. Are you with me, brothers and sisters, right? Now, so he said now, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So friends, we believe that these threefold, the threefold power that will eventually unite to fight against God's commandment keeping people are these. Fill it in now. They are the dragon. Fill it in now. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Now this is symbolic this is codified language we want to now unravel who is really behind the dragon or what 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 does he represent the beast and the false prophet now brothers and sisters now the dragon when we think of the dragon right who comes to our mind obviously the devil note your handout says now the dragon is said to be satan Revelation 12, 9, he's known as that old dragon called the serpent and the devil. So when we think of the dragon in scripture or in prophecy, we usually primary refer to Satan, right? It was he that moved upon Herod to put the Savior to death. Now, note now, we're told in the book Great Controversy, page 438, we're told now, but the chief agent of Satan in making war upon Christ and his people during the first century of the Christian era was the Roman Empire, in which paganism was the prevailing religion. Follow me now, look what she says now. Thus while the dragon primarily represents Satan, in a secondary sense, it is a symbol of who? It is a symbol of Pagan Rome, brothers and sisters. So when we think of the dragon, who comes to our mind? It comes from, it, it, we think of pagan Rome. But guess what now? It's not just pagan Rome or paganism. So the dragon in Revelation 16 verse 13, primary represents Revelation 6 verse 13, Satan. But secondarily, it represents pagan Rome. But follow me now. But there are other examples of the dragon such as Islam, Hinduism, Taoism, Buddhism, Shikhism, Waka, cults, and some sects, and all the isms, schisms. So um, when we think of paganism, and paganism by definition is anything that don't, that don't embrace Christianity, right? And so we know that these religions, they don't have not even a, 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 leaven, <laughs> a leaven grain of Christianity in them. So again, paganism is not just um, the dragon is not just paganism, um, pagan Rome. It is all forms of paganism. Friends, we got to get that, right? The dragon. Now, the second thing that is mentioned in the text is the beast. The dragon, the beast. Now, based on historicism now and historical Adventist teaching, the beast in Revelation 13 verses 1 through 10 is described is ascribed another beast like unto a leopard to which the dragon gave his power his seat and great authority watch it now we're told now 
The symbol, this symbol represents the papacy or the Roman Catholic Church. Friends, this is fundamental Adventism. This is not fanatical doctrine. And we're not attacking churches. No, we're not. We're not attacking people. But this is what it is. Which succeeded the power, which succeeded to the power, the seed and great authority, once held by the ancient pagan Rome. So we have the dragon is pagan Rome, but, but it also entails all pagan, all pagan religions. The beast, Revelation 6.13, represents the Roman Catholic Church system, the harlot, scarlet Church of Rome, Papa. But then John speaks of a false prophet or false preacher. Right now, the false prophet, this false prophet represents apostate Protestantism in the United States. But guess what? Not just the United States, it also represents all Sunday church organization globally. Now friends, when we teach this, we are not condemning people. As a matter of fact, God hasn't given me the right to judge or to condemn people. But I have the right to judge and condemn ideas and institution. And the very fact that I condemn an idea or I condemn an institution, it does not mean I am condemning people. Now, God has sincere Christians in all religious groups. God has people in the pagan world. They are looking, they are longing for something, they don't know what. But guess what? When they hear that cry, they will come out and follow Jesus, right? And so, here are some of the examples of the false prophets. Um, we believe men like the doctrines like T.T. T. Jakes and Creflo Dollar and Joel Austin and Paula White and all these guys because they are teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. They are a false prophet because they are prophesying peace and safety. They are prophesying falsely. It doesn't mean they cannot be saved, but brothers and sisters, they cannot be saved in that mentality. They must renounce the, 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 these false doctrines and they must embrace the doctrines and the teachings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters. So we have identified that the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, that the dragon, let me back up, that the dragon, right? I just want to make sure we're on the same page now, right? That the dragon represents paganism. The beast represents Roman Catholicism and the false prophet represents all um, false Sunday preachers because they're not teaching the truth. Now, let's move on. Number two now, it says in your handout now, is there another threefold union mentioned in the Bible? Friends, you know, for every Bible teaching, the devil has a counterfeit. Now, we don't study the counterfeit, we study the true, Right? But is there another threefold union mentioned in the Bible apart from the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet? Yes. In John chapter 5, verse 7, 1 John 5, verse 7, the Bible says, For there are three, yes, threefold, for there are three that bear record in heaven. Who are they? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And they are one, one in aim and one in purpose, one in doctrine. So friends, yes, there is another threefold union mentioned in the scriptures. As a matter of fact, you know, when we refer to this threefold union, I know that within the Adventist church today, there is big debate over whether we should refer to God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost as a trinity, right? And um, a lot of people have left the Adventist church because they believe that the Adventist church is teaching heretical doctrine, the Trinity. And, and, and friends, it is true. I must say it, it is true that words don't always mean what we think they mean. For instance, when I was growing up, to be gay meant to be happy. Today, if you say you're gay, people think that you are a homosexual. Right? And so the word gay does not mean happy, doesn't mean happy no way. You know what I'm saying? It means that you have chosen an alternative lifestyle. Now, case in point now, and I've oftentimes used the example, when we hear the word the immaculate conception, right? 
when the average person thinks of this phrase, the Immaculate Conception, he or she thinks, oh, that means the Holy Ghost came and conceived, came, overshadowed Mary and conceived Jesus Christ. And that's what the average person thinks the, the Immaculate Conception means. But friends, no, the Immaculate Conception does not mean that. The Immaculate Conception means that Mary herself was immaculately conceived. And that's why when they say Hail Mary, they'll say Hail Mary full of grace. You see, full of grace. So Mary herself was sinless. That's what it means. And so we have to understand what words mean. Now, friends, when we use the word Trinity to define the God, and I know three, or in Jamaican we say tree, some say, what's wrong with if I say Trinity and the Godhead? Isn't it saying tree? Yes and no. It, it, it's totally different, right? As a matter of fact, there's a book that I have. Um, is it right there? I can't, can't put my hand on it now. Very good book that really explains the Godhead. I may try to find it. Is it Patrick Jones' book? You see it? It's up there. It's a purple book. All right, uh, Tried and Truth, it's a, uh, it's a book about the, the, the Godhead. All right, while she's looking, there it is right there. Please pass it for me. Please pardon me, this is kind of unprofessional, right? Look, right there, purple one. Is that it? The Tried and Truth. The tried, a tried and now, if you, if you have... <laughs> If you are challenged or if you have challenges with the, the Godhead, I would love to refer you to a book which I think is the best I have read or I'm reading thus far. And it really explain, it really puts the Trinity in its proper sphere. The book is entitled The Truth and the Trident. Please put it in, in, the, um, in the chat group, Sister Not The Truth. The truth and its trident. The truth and its trident. All right. I'll hold it up right now. Now, so when we ref when when we refer to, um, so we don't want to. We, we shouldn't use the word Trinity to define God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. What we should use is the biblical ter the biblical definition, which is found in Acts chapter seven twenty nine. It says, "For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the what." that the Godhead. And so a safe definition to refer, refer or the heavenly trio, as the Spirit of Prophecy says, use the Godhead. If you use the Godhead, you're biblical, and nobody cannot misunderstand what you are saying. When you use the word Trinity, there's a lot that is bundled up in that word which is not necessarily true, right? And I wish I had time to go into that, but again, I encourage you, get the book, The Truth Trident, and it really speaks about um, the, 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 um, the Godhead. It's very, 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 very good, right? Now, so, so here we see that there are three, another three. Oh, fill it in now, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And then you are some who do not believe that the Holy Spirit is God. And um, some, who, some are offended when you say that he is God. Now, I personally believe, in my little own meager study, I personally believe that the Holy Spirit is the third member of the Godhead. Some will differ. And, you know, if, if you differ, well, that you have the right to differ. Right? And, and, and as someone once said, we don't, well, let me not say that. But the point is this now, we are to respect each other even if we don't see eye to eye on certain things right now. So let's break it down. So we have another we have another threefold union. We have the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and then we have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. What can we learn from these three now? I haven't forgotten my title, the three persecuting powers that RFC is commenting, but I want to I bring you up to, up to pace with this prophecy. Now, note now, this is Satan's trinity, the, God, um, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Follow me now. This trinity is based upon the concept of the Godhead itself. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet 
are the manifest are the manifestation of one being Satan. And so you must understand when we use the word Trinity, what we're really ascribing to the Godhead is the manifestation of one being. Right? We're saying that, that right? there is a there's a manifestation of one being. Note now, right? Right? Note now. The true Godhead now, on the other hand, is composed of three distinct eternal beings, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not only, not only is there a counterfeit of the Godhead at the end, but there is also a counterfeit of God's end time messages, the three angels. So we believe, brothers and sisters, that Satan's dragon, the beast, and the false prophet is a counterfeit. As you're going to see, it is a counterfeit of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, so the great counterfeit. Now we're going to show you how it is a it is a great counterfeit now right now. Let's look at the dragon. The dragon was the first of the threefold powers mentioned by John, the dragon. Now, we believe that Satan intended for the dragon to counterfeit who? The father. Watch it now. You got to you got to get this now. We are reasoning from the context of the plan of salvation. Watch it now. The dragon seems to be the counterfeit of God the Father. He clearly, he is clearly the leader of the group, calling up the others and giving them their orders. Watch it now. You're going to see that, friends. Now, so the dragon counterfeits God the Father. Who is the dragon? The dragon is Satan, yes? But the dragon is paganism. Right? Watch it now. The beast. The beast, we know, the beast is the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church. Who do you think the beast counterfeits? The beast counterfeits Jesus Christ. How do you get this? Note now. You see, the sea leopard beast is clearly a counterfeit of Jesus Christ. The second person of the Godhead. And there are some, there are so much parallels between the Catholic Church and Jesus Christ. Here, is, here are a few of them. Jesus began his ministry when he came up out of the water. Isn't that true? Baptized at the end of the 483 years, which, which brought to view the 69 and two weeks, 27 AD. When did the papacy begin its, 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 its work? John said, I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Isn't that right? One more now. The papacy, Jesus received a mortal wound. Did he not? Yes. Did he not die? Yes. The papacy also received a mortal wound. Right? Wounded unto death. Did he not revive? Yes. And so, friends, you can see that, and, and there's a lot more we can, we can, we can go through, we can, we can um, cover. But no, you see this, the sea leopard beast is clearly a counterfeit of Jesus Christ. The second person of the Godhead. Now, the Christian read of Revelation would recall John 14, 9. says, anyone hmm, who has seen me has seen the Father. The sea beast of Revelation 13 has the same kind of relationship with the dragon that Jesus has with the Father. Friends, if you see Jesus, who do you see? You see the Father. Let me, let me, let me back and forth. If you see Jesus... You see the father. If you see the beast, the leopard-like beast, do you know who do you see? You see pagan, paganism. You're going to see that, friends. Because, as a matter of fact, did you know, brothers and sisters, you should know this. You should know this. That the Roman Catholic Church system was never a Christian church. It has been a pagan institution from its very inception. All right, watch this now, brothers and sisters. Right now, who gave Jesus his power and authority? Who did Jesus say give him his power and authority? In Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power 
is given unto me in heaven and earth. Who do you think gave Christ his power? Now, in the context of salvation now, right? It was his father. It was his father who gave him his power and authority. Now, look at the parallel now. Look at the leopard light beast in relation to um, the, um, pig, the, uh, the, um, the, the dragon, right? Note now, there are further parallels. In verse 2, the dragon, which is paganism, right? Or Satan, paganism, right? Gave the sea beast, watch it now, his what? His power, his throne, and great authority. This reminds one of, the, of Matthew 18, 28, where Jesus said, All authority is given unto me on earth has been given to me. Who gave him that authority? The Father. Just as Jesus received his authority from the Father, so the sea beast, which is the Catholic Church system, received from the dragon paganism. Now look at this parallel now, friends. Look at this parallel now. Number four now. Who gave the sea leopard beast popery his power and authority? Remember, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Who gave the leopard beast his power and authority? Revelation 13, verse 2. The Bible says this now. The Bible says this. The Bible says this now. And I saw a beast rise up out of... Sorry, I saw a beast, sorry, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, the feet of the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his what? Power, his seat, and his great authority. Wow! Just as how Jesus got power and authority from the Father, so the beast, which is the Catholic Church, got its seat, its power, and its authority from paganism or pagan Rome, which came directly from the devil himself. Diabolical. So it came from the dragon or paganism. Wow! You see the great counterfeit? By accident, my friends? No, by design. And friends, unfortunately, this is one of the carnal teachings of the Adventist church. No other church out there can put it together like this. Now, I'm going to read something to you. Not in your handout, but I should, I should have put it, I should have put it in, my, um, in your lesson. I'm going to have Sister Not to read this, right? Read this for us, and it shows you how the Catholic church received its power. This is a historical document. Uh, document dated right we're told now the church of rome willingly accepts the fact that she received her temporal power from the caesars who ruled pagan rome uh -huh. we read from her writers the following listen now not in your hand up, but this affirms who gave the catholic church its power remember the catholic church was never a christian church never all right, we're told now. This is from Reverend James Con Conroy, American Catholic Quarterly Review, April 1911. Nelson, right? Please read now. Long? Long ages ago, when Rome, through the neglect of the Western emperors, was left to the mercy of the barbarous hordes, the Romans turned to one figure for aid and protection and asked him to rule them. And thus, in this simple manner, the best title of all the kingly right commenced the temporal sovereignty of the popes. And meekly stepping to the throne of Caesar, the vicar of Christ, took up the scepter to which the emperors and kings of Rome were to bow in reverence through so many ages. It is, friends, historically. It is historically, linguistically, that the Catholic Church received its seat and its power from pagan Rome. Friends, you see the parallel now. Now, what about the false prophet? We believe the false prophet, the dragon, is a counterfeit for God the Father. The beast is a counterfeit for Jesus Christ. Now, who do you think the false prophet is a counterfeit of? The, counter, the false prophet is a counterfeit for the Holy Spirit. Now, we know who the false prophet represents. The false prophet represents 
apostate protestantism evangelicalism with all the ecumenicalism sick brothers and sisters and we're we're seeing that the listen there are certain things i believe is 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 lost it's a lost battle in the church but just because it is lost doesn't mean we ought not cry against it ecumenicalism is a lost battle friends they are not going to stop um, reaching over the abyss to class the hands of its spiritualism they are not going to stop bringing in these first day singers um, who know nothing of our doctrine who their very the very songs they see they, they sing is a contradiction of our doctrines and we have seen it now brothers and sisters it is, it is the norm it is the norm now to have a massive campaign and who do you think is opening up a famous singer in the evangelical world that's the last battle but just because it lost doesn't mean I'm not gonna lift up my voice and cry against it somebody said the other day one one pastor said that jewelry is a lost cause maybe lost to you but it's not lost not lost in this book now we gonna cry against it and the wearing of jewelry um, for adornment in the church will never be right now there were functional jewelry yes but we ain't got no kings and we definitely ain't got no queens and Peter reminds us that when Jesus comes a second time he says the elements will melt with fervent heat if you've got that, that, that finger ring or that nose ring or that tongue ring or that belly ring prior to getting the seven last plate it's going to melt on you it's clear it's clear brothers and sisters it is very very clear right now so the so so here we see the false prophet now he is a counterfeit of the holy spirit now he said now how did you get this i want you to follow my logic now what is one of the many roles of the holy spirit now friends today unfortunately there are some who believe that when the holy ghost comes upon you he tickles you he teases you he tantalizes you that's not the work of the Holy Ghost now the Holy Spirit has several roles but one of his primary roles is found in John chapter 6 verse number 44 the Bible says now Jesus says now no man can come unto me except the Father hath sent him draw sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last his friends did you know that one of the one of the primary works of the Holy Spirit it is to draw us to Jesus Christ friends you can't go you can't even repent the Bible says it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance when you spoken out of turn or out of character and you cool down and you realize that man you know I was a little bit too hasty who do you think is bringing that conviction it is the Holy Ghost and where is he drawing you to he's saying you need to repent you need a mediator now watch this powerful parallel now brothers and sisters watch this parallel now right the false prophet which is apostate protestantism is a counterfeit of the Holy Ghost watch it now why do we say that he promotes the interests of the sea beast mercy now, who is the false prophet? Apostate Protestantism. Who is the sea beast? Catholicism. Ha <laughs> ha! Watch it now. I'm going to break this down. Just as the Holy Spirit does not speak of himself, but instead he glorifies Jesus. John 16, 13. The role of the Holy Spirit is to promote Christ. The role of the lamb beast or the false prophet is to promote the sea beast which is Catholicism the counterfeit Christ friends what is the role what role is America praying prophecy America the Bible says that there was that that there was a lamb like beast and he what he began to promote the interest of the leopard like beast so friends get it now the purpose of the the false prophet huh is to pull you back to the beast who got his power from the dragon you see the, the, the friends friends I hope you're getting this now I wish I had time to go but I don't want to lose I'm, I'm trying to get to RFC in a minute but I want to just lay a foundation friends hear me well friends 
America plays two roles, and America plays three roles, in my opinion. One, you can make some money. <laughs> you, you, can, you can better yourself. Nothing is wrong with that. You can enrich yourself financially, educationally, yes. Ain't nothing wrong with some, some old good old Uncle Ben. You know what I'm saying? Beside from that, from a prophetic standpoint, America only played two roles in, 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 in prophecy. America served as a haven for those who were fleeing Europe, the Mayflower. The Bible says that the dragon cast what? Flood. After the woman and the earth helped the woman and swallowed up the flood. So America was a haven for God's true church to thrive, to get back strength. The second purpose America serves in prophecy, where she be, after she, she goes down now, she is going to lead everybody back to the Catholic Church. As a matter of fact, the Catholic Church will not be able to wield its power, its persecuting power, unless America helps. Because America has bases everywhere. The Catholic Church will not be successfully promoting her dogmas unless America aids her. You see, friends, the purpose of America in prophecy is to lead us back to Catholicism or apostate Protestantism to lead us back to Catholicism. You see, friends, and friends, all these first day guys are doing is leading their congregation right back to Rome. The purpose of the Holy Ghost is not to lead us unto himself. He leads us back to Jesus and Jesus to God and God to the earth made new. The purpose of the false prophet is to lead us, or not lead us, some of, some of them back to the papacy, and the papacy lead them back to the dragon, to paganism, to Satan, and then right to hell, Gehenai. You see the parallel, brothers and sisters. Friends, I hope you're getting this. I hope you're getting this, brothers and sisters. Now, watch it now. So we see them now, we see the great counterfeit. They all have a role. Again, let me emphasize that I want to emphasize these two sisters that the role that America apostate Protestantism plays is that it leads, it will lead people back to the Catholic Church. Right? The role of Jesus is to, the Holy Spirit is to lead us back to Jesus. The role of Jesus is to lead us back to the Father. No man coming to the Father but by me. And you can't come to me unless the Holy Spirit draw you. In that order. You can't get to Father 101, Father 102, and bypass Jesus 101. Is you crazy? So likely now, you can never get to the papacy unless the false prophets lead the evangelicals. And you, what now? and you can't get back to the dragon unless the beast brings you back there. And friends, thus far, everybody who who refuses to, de to, to detach themselves from the false prophets is heading back to Rome. And when you get to Rome, all Rome's going to do, lead you right back to the dragon, paganism, and Satan. Friends, in that order. I hope you're hearing me tonight. Now, watch this now, brothers and sisters, now. Number four now. No, not number four. <laughs> number six. Number six now. All right. This is just a this is this is a uh, this is a quick a quick review. Let me get to number six, my, my thing. All right, number six now. Number six. All right, number six now. Now, what binds Satan's threefold union together? We know what binds um, the furniture together. Some good old gorilla glue. I don't think they're even giving you a gorilla glue. They're probably giving you some pony or whatever glue they give you. But something binds the chair together, whether it's staple, whether it's a screw, whether it's some glue. What binds Satan threefold union together? Look at what Jesus says in John 8 44 now. Jesus said this now Ye are of the Father, your devil, speaking to the Pharisees, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And abode not in the truth because he because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And so anybody who comes out of him is a liar. 
And remember, and so friends, guess what now? If the dragon, Satan is the father of lies, if the dragon came out of Satan, paganism, then it's a lie. And if paganism came out of, if Catholicism came out of paganism, it's a lie. And because the false prophets now are just echoing the, the doctrines of a part of Rome, guess what now? The things that binds them all together, friends, is all lies. Paganism is a lie. All this yoga stuff and all that stuff, it's a lie. It lies, lies, lies. So lies bind Satan threefold unity. And by the way, all half truth is a lie. Now, watch it now. What is it that binds the Godhead together? John 14, 6 says now, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So what binds the Godhead together? Friends, it is truth. Truth. God is all truth, the God of truth. Our elder brother is truth, and the Holy Ghost is the spirit of truth. They're all truth, brother. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So it is truth that binds the Godhead together. Now, watch it now. What two major doctrines do Satan threefold union have in common? What two major lies? runs through their tentacles, their veins. Here it is, friends. It is the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness. Friends, every pagan religion believe, the dragon, every pagan religion believe that when you die, you are not dead. They believe the soul is immortal. The I and I ever live it. The I can die. They believe you live on, you go on. They believe that death is just a transition. No, death ain't no, this is a pause, this is a sleep. You is dead. You don't go on. Nobody goes on. You know what I'm saying? Right? The Catholic Church believes that when you die, you're not dead. And as good as she may sound to some, Joyce Myers, if you ask her right now, what happens to you when you die? She will tell you, you go to heaven. You're looking down from heaven to, on your loved ones. Friends, that is a lie. And that is held in common by all of them. And then, another doctrine which is, which is held by, by all of them, I believe, is the business of worshiping the sun. All pagan religion worship the sun. And Sunday, you know this, is an outgrowth of Sunday worship. That's history. That is history, brothers and sisters. Now, so the two doctrines, the glue, the gorilla glue, the crazy glue that binds Satan threefold unit together is lies. But what two specific lies? The immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness. Now, we're told in Greek controversy now, through the two great errors, what are they? The immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness Satan will bring the people under his deception. Friends, and there was a time in the history of the Adventist church that when it came on to the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, every Seventh-day Adventist knew this. Today it's not so. Now, look at it now. There's a lot more I can say, but I have to cut it short now, right now. Which threefold union finally wins the battle? Is it the dragon, the beast, or the false prophet? Or is it the Godhead? Now, in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11, 14, 15, 19, and 20, we see who wins the final battle. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, the Bible says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was clothed with, was called faithful and true. And in righteousness doth he judge and make war. Verse 12 says now, And his eyes were as the flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he 
and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name was the Word of God. Look at verse 14 now. It says now, and the armies of heaven uh, were, and the armies which were in heaven followed, up, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And he hath on his vesture, what's his vesture, right? And on his thigh written, King of kings and Lord of lords. When John saw Jesus, John said he saw something written on his thigh. I have heard people use this text as justification of getting tattoos on your thigh, putting loved ones on your thigh, putting dead babies and dead relatives, name, faces, pictures on your thigh or on your calf. My brothers and sisters, this is figuratively. And any Bible student know you cannot use symbolism and base doctrines and teaching. It's a symbolism, a symbol, right? Symbolism. Now, look at verse 19 now, right? And the beast, mm, which I saw, and I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and his armies. And the beast, Catholicism, and the false prophet, apostate Protestantism, that work miracles before him, with which he deceived them had received the mark of the beast, and them that worship his image, these were cast alive into the lake of fire. So friends, who wins the battle? It's the Godhead. And by the way, did you catch it? Did you catch that doctrine? Here it is, friends. You know, one of the false teaching that the false prophet teaches is that when you die, you go to hell. So they teach that only dead people go to hell. But this is text debunks that. It says that when hellfire takes place, <laughs> they were cast alive. Friends, let me say this. Nobody will go into the lake of fire dead or hell. Gehenai. You see how it's confusing? That's why the Bible calls them the false prophet because they are prophesying falsely. They are teaching falsely. They are singing falsely. And friends, I'm telling you, it is a natural law of nature that by beholding, you become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the theme it is left to dwell upon. And if you watch these false apostate, and if you keep on singing their song, by and by you'll take on their dogmas and their doctrine, and you'll get in them spirit. That's why God says, come out of Babylon and leave them alone. So the Godhead. And so friends, you see that our pioneers had a correct understanding of this three great persecuting power. And it was, it was after reading this that RFC, RF Cottrell, used his poetic skills and he penned to me one of the most sublime prophetic, prophetic poems that has ever graced humanity. This was published in Review and Herald, April 16th, 1861. And I believe that many dated their conversion, many were stabilized in the present truth as a result of reading the poem written by RFC. Now I'm going to read it. You have it on your, hand, on, on, on your paper and we're going to see if this man is talking truth now. First stanza says, on Patmos' lonely island, the loved disciples saw three notable opposers with saints proclaiming war. The first, the great red dragon, with features fierce and rare, the pagan superstition erecting everywhere. Lord, have mercy. Give this brother, drop the mic right, we, 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 could, drop, we could just drop it right here. This is hot. Who? Nobody writes like this today. When was the last time you saw any prophetic, prophetic poem in the Ruby and Herald? You saw this, you see this, all, all this other stuff. The second stanza said now, 
But, but watch the transition now. Watch his meditation now. But, but, after, but after some few ages, the dragon's power grew weak. His voiters forsook him, the living God to seek. So feigned he to conversion. Hmm. And lo, the beast uprose with all his papal terror, truth, progress to oppose. Wow! Did you get that line, sister? Not so feigned he to conversion. The beast himself claimed conversion. I think of Constantine. I think of baptized paganism. I think of just of Peter, which became Jupiter, and, and Saturn became Venus, became Mary, and a whole house of pantheon came in the church. Look at verse number three now. Watch transition now. The ancient pagan images, its doctrines and its laws, were now entitled Christian. To help his hellish cause. Lord have mercy. Christmas, Valentine's Day, all of them. Don't bring none of them near me. Twas thus the wily serpent pursued his artful plan. And ages upon ages, the blood of martyrs rang. And remember, this is speaking to persecution in the first century. This brother was on point doctrinally. Lord have mercy. Look what he goes on to say now. Fourth stanza. But two and forty months mm, was all the time allowed the beasts. What beast is that? The Catholic Church was forty and two months. Times, times, dividing the times. Twelve hundred and sixty year. Five thirty-eight, seventeen ninety-eight. Right? And ere the period ended. So had his strength decreased, his days of rule were shortened, his power to call for blood. The earth had opened her mouth for saints to swallow up the flood. Lord have mercy. What earth? What is this earth? This is America. This is the false prophet. Look at, look at stanza five now. And yet there is another mm, to act upon the stage through whom the same old serpent will manifest his rage. A beast which, though he outward was lamb-like, fear and mild, spake like pagan dragon, ferocious, loud and wild. Who is that beast? That is America. That is America in prophecy. Look at stanza 6 now. It says now, Though all men, though, no, no, this is the, this touched my heart, this touched my heart, and this was the reason for the civil war. I saw that, let me not quote it yet, verse 6 now. Though all men are made equal, she holds, he, so holds he in his creed. The slaves from out their bondage must never be freed. And though, and though in, in things religious, all men are to be free, it means when laws divine, when human laws agree. Friends, did, and did you know the reason why the Civil War? We are told, uh, it was volume five, she, volume one says, I saw that God was punishing this, this nation for the high crime of slavery. He was punishing the South for the evil of slavery, and he was punishing the North for allowing it to continue so long. And you reap what you sow. All those sons that were lost in the Civil War, it was almost payback for those slaves who lost their lives in the transition of the Atlantic and who lost their lives on this soil. Friends, and this is serious. This is serious. Stanza 6 7 says, once empires, thrones, and kingdoms with papacy made bold to slay the host of martyrs with cruelties untold. But now a fear republic, a protestant so mild, usurp the dangerous power 
and with the same runs wild. It's amazing. In, in stanza two, he said this to slay the host of martyrs with cruelties untold. Friends, we are told that the persecution that the Catholic Church invented, men had studied on the Satan's devices, and we're told it's only in the judgment will you see the horrible atrocities that the Catholic Church used. It was the rack or conversion. Stanza 8 says this now. The old red pagan dragon turned papist on, his, on the day. He saw that Christian's doctrine were like to bear sway. He seized on the scriptures and keep them all unseen and offers for a stipend to tell what they mean. Mercy, this is, this is how they got rich. It was Tesla who once sang as soon when he was raising money to build that old corruptible dome, the St. Peter's Basilica. Tesla said, as soon as, a, in a, as soon as a coin in the chest rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Stanza 9 says, At length from out its prison, the Bible has been freed, and loudly now is heralded as Protestant, Protestant seals creed. Sail creed. The cry is now, the Bible, the Bible, that alone come drink from the pure fountain that flows from out of the throne. Now look at verse 10 now. Stanza 10. High hope is widely cherished. The Bible has been freed. And now tis through its thought that Satan is overcome indeed. He sees that mere profession is but an arzu gaze. And lo, he now espouses with Protestants their cause. Wow! That is deep, you know. That is so profound. He goes on to say now, the Bible scattered broadcast is laid upon the shelf. A man is seldom met who reads it for himself. And though some few, like Timothy, have read it from their youth, tradition is still followed instead of living truth. Friends, we are told that there are two streams that flow in Christendom. That is scripture and tradition, and out of the two, tradition is preferred. And Sunday is a man-made tradition. This brother was on point. My Lord, what, what, what a point. Verse 12 says now, the last great persecution is drawing on because some few will heed the Bible and keep its righteous laws, while others, the great masses professing still the same, hold on to papal errors, errors and all their groundless claims. Friends, Sunday is a papal error, just like the immortality of the soul. Who are these few who heed the Bible? Who are the few that's keeping his laws? That little remnant. And then he says the, 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 the last great persecution is drawing on. And you think you have problems? Huh? Verse, stanza 12 says, the ba huh? 13. 13, thank you. The battle is, sorry, the battle soon is coming. Choose now while yet ye may. The Bible and its precepts and Jesus to obey. Soon closes up probation then while the dragon rage and battle with the remnant most cruel he will rage. The dragon was wrought with the woman and he went to make war. Verse 14 says, but short shall be the conflict, victorious the saints, redeemed from all oppression and freed from all complaints. With shouts and songs celestial, 
triumphant will they sing the praise and the victory of Jesus Christ, their King. Wow. All I can say is, wow, the three persecuting powers. Friends, where has this spirit gone? Where are our young people who are using their poetic skills to disseminate the three angels' messages for this time. If you are watching and you have that ability, now I can't write no poetry. I can quote it. <laughs> While nations are to perish in their sins, to sin the church, the sin of leprosy begins. The minister's job with zeal sincere to watch the fountain and preserve it clear nods and sleeps upon the brink while, oil, while, while others poison what the flock must drink. Ah, I know some poetry. That's from William Cooper, Cooper right? But my point is saying, I pray that God will resurrect this spirit of poetry that is laid dormant within the church. And you begin to use your platform, social media, to put words together. Not, not that which provoke people to commit sin, but that which provoke them into righteousness. When we think of R.F. R. F. Cottrell, a tremendous pioneer for the Lord, a man who loves the Lord, a man who saw the folly of his ways, a man who was humble, but also a man who was able to use poetry to convey the prophetic teachings of our church. He died and he now sleeps in Jesus awaiting the voice of God. Loving Father in heaven, we are so thankful and grateful that Lord, we are a part of a tremendous legacy. Men and women, Lord, who laid their all on the altar, who yielded their mental faculties to the Holy Spirit, and tremendous was their works. We pray that as we go through our lives, and as we live for Thee, Lord, we will, we will not let not one of our talents go unused. For those who have the power to sing, may they continue to sing for Jesus and to advocate and to utter our doctrines in song. For those who can preach, for those who can exhort, for those who can write, but alas, for those who are poetic inclined, may they use that gift, Lord, to put pen and paper and words together, scriptural words, historical words, to rightly convey the truth for this time and to uplift Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Father, as we're about to part now and to go to our rest, give us all a good night's rest. We pray we commit mind, soul, and body under thy watchful care. Keep us, O oh God, from the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And may we lo ever look to the author and finish off our faith. The triune Godhead is our prayer in Jesus' name. All right, saints of God, I hope that you were blessed by this study this little um, trip down memory lane as we uh, began to unearth one of the hidden treasures um, of our movement, RFC, and his poetic skills. I pray that you will have a blessed night if you're going to go to bed or whatever you go, and may the peace of God be with you. We look forward to seeing you Sabbath morning. Friends, we are resuming 1844 re-examined, reaffirmed, and we are on the second of the feast days. You don't want to miss that study. We will be looking at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We were managed to get three powerful lectures out of that one. So you don't want to miss it this Sabbath. As of always, we say in the words of the ancient, Behold, saints, the eye forward.